Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending this roundtable. My name is Kevin Pachuro, and I'm the Communication and Development Coordinator at Thanks for Nothing. And I'm really, really thrilled to introduce our guests today. So first, Leiko Ekimura. She's an artist represented by the gallery Peter Kitchman and the gallery Carsten Reeve, originally from Japan and now living in Berlin and Cologne. Germany. She has been an artist for over 40 years, and she has exhibited in many internationally renowned institutions, including the National Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo and the Kulumba Museum in Cologne. Her poetical work reflects the different cultures that have nourished her. Then, Maita El Sabdala. She is a multidisciplinary Emirati artist represented by the Tabari art space. She creates stories inspired by old tales, myths, and ideas about gender. She uses film, photos, and paintings to express them. This year, she exhibited at Art Dubai and KBHG Foundation. And last not but least, Elena Sorokina, she is a curator and an art historian with particular focus on sustainable curating. She served as curatorial advisor of Documenta 14 in Athens, Paso, and was chief curator at the High Institute of Fine Arts, Belgium, in 2017-18. In 2022, she co-curated the Armenian Pavillon at the Venice Biennale. She is also the co-founder of the Initiative for Practices and Visions of Radical Care. Her work shows her involvement to ecological awareness. Today, we will talk about the myth as vector for human ecology. So I'm happy to leave it to you to discuss this subject. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Opportunity to speak about actually something which has been part of my curatorial practice for a while, meaning uh, mythologists and ecologists, and how contemporary artists address these very ancient stories. And uh, this is also what uh, allows me to connect to the work of Leiko and to the work of Maita, who I thank uh, a lot to be here with us. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of starting with some kind of theoretical issues, I thought uh, I would give you a couple of examples about how I address this issue. Or let's, let's say this intersection, how I address such the intersection in my curatorial practice. So, and let me also start with the future. And the future is in Sri Lanka. Because we are working now uh, as an initiative, but I'm specifically in charge of uh, the initiative's uh, project uh, for Columbus Pop uh, to open in uh, January 2024. Uh, Columbus Pop is curated by Natasha Gidbala, who you uh, see, she's a dear friend and a colleague. She was also a um, curatorial advisor of the documenta, so we work together. And I was very uh, glad that she invited us. Why is it so important? Because uh, the next Columbus Club is about forests. A forest is a place of knowledge. And a forest is a place of magic. And the forest is a place of these multiple intersections between humans and non-humans. So we are preparing uh, several projects for this. And um, we are very glad to, uh, uh, to participate. Do we have the next image? And something very important, which also brings us, you know, I'm sort of kind of like feeding in with this uh, multiple intersection between mythologies and ecologies. So the starting point uh, and the point of inspiration for this project is the legendary book uh, by Ursula Le Guin, who inspired our car, for example, the movie. But it was published first in 1972. Um, uh, you see here two early uh, covers of the book. And why is it an inspiration? Because uh, very early, in, already in 72, she did something what we're talking about today, meaning all these intersections. So the forest is actually 
not a nature. It is something where people belong. So she speaks about some sentient hyper super organism in this book, and this is why it is so important for the project, first inspiration of the project. And also, also Le Guin was part of the Venice Biennial. So the Venice Biennial, the Milk of Dreams, which uh, happened uh, took place uh, last year, uh, also took inspiration from also Le Guin from a different book, but. Um, I'm saying all that for you to understand that the topic we're discussing today, or let's say all these multiple intersections, how uh, people, how artists address the ecology uh, from today's point of view, that it is very present in different projects, also in important projects. And also as Nicolas Borio, you know, the first discussion today was by Nicolas Borio. So Nicolas uh, was speaking about it today, because how ecology is important, how uh, it is present in curatorial work, in artistic work, um, yes, and then Maria Varner, this is, this is the, she uh, stands for the Venice Biennial. She was one of the inspirational writers and thinkers for the previous Venice Biennial. Um, and this text, uh, uh, version of this text is also published in the catalog. Uh, so, and just give you a very briefly couple of examples. For example, um, this is an exhibition I co-curated in Istanbul, Crystal Clear, the work you see has a technological point of view on mythology. Uh, it is Yazan Khalili, um, an artist who has developed um, a take and a, a very specific direction on Medusa. And he draws a parallel between the myth we all know uh, of Medusa and um, surveillance, special facial recognition. I'm not going to detail, but um, his point is that facial recognition is going under the skin today. Uh, and then the next image, uh, yes, uh, so this is fragility, and this is where I really looked, and now we're really progressively turning to the questions uh, about metamorphosis because the Venice Biennial spoke a lot about metamorphosis, so how um, artists use, how, how artists address, how they depict it. So, and what it actually means, because it is very, very present. Um, very present uh, for a long time, but also it was important back then, and are, I'm speaking about the 1920s, so, um, uh, sorry, I'm speaking about 2020s, because it was uh, the COVID time and mutation was so present. So metamorphosis and mutation is something which the artists were addressing quite a lot. So, and the last one. So, and then uh, just my last example, this is Kubra Academy, her work, you probably, many of you know, uh, who are in the audiences, and she was in my exhibition in 2019, which was entitled from uh, Flat of Light, uh, Song Smith and Other Stories. Uh, and her take uh, on mythologies is um, feminization. So she tells the stories which we recognize here, the Jonas uh, and many others also. She tells the stories from the feminine point of view or even from the feminist point of view. For example, in this particular drawings, she replaces masculine figures by feminine figures. So, and this is what I have been actually fascinated by, how uh, artists manage to create this very contemporary takes on mythologies, meaning from the point of view of technology, from the point of view of ecology, and also from the point of view, uh, for example, of social media. This take also exists, but it's not the point today. So, uh, and this is why uh, I was absolutely delighted to speak to um, uh, Leiko and also to Maita, because uh, these questions are very present in their work. And I would like to address my first question and also maybe a mini, mini introduction uh, to Leiko, if you don't mind. Um, yes. Uh, so, um, I mean, you, uh, one of your exhibitions was entitled Metamorphosis, wasn't it? And uh, in your work, uh, the figures very often somehow are kind of in this transition, in the, in the transitional period between two states, mm -hmm. or between human and animal, or between human and 
object or non-human. Uh, and also in one of your conversations I listened to, you said that my work is about transformation. What um, would you say about it? Thank you for the invitation and one in an introduction. And uh, I think it's uh, <clears throat> completely you are right. It's uh, I told that, and I'm still thinking about this process, which is never ending. I started with also the idea of uh, when I came to Europe, and you know, with more than 40 years, it was a uh, um, a lot of uh, confrontation with um, very much European Eurocentric idea of art. So none uh, Asian or no. Another gender problem was you no know, women was in the art scene or very few. So and, and from this background, um, we have really changed a lot. It's very positive, but still, my dream is somehow we uh, we are communicate beyond uh, languages, beyond the religion, beyond histories. So this is my belief. So it's a deep in our conscious subconsciousness, we have a lot of stories coming. This is my thought on mythology. So it is uh, the narratives that I think in a narrative of our time. It's this uh, um, idea, and not only idea, it's an uh, attitude. Attitude towards this uh, time development and also crisis and this ecological aspect and sustainability. These are now um, very mottos. But I'm telling you the truth. I did it more than 40 years, my process. And you would like to know maybe how. Uh, for example, um, you know, my generation at the time in the 80s, uh, many uh, artists think <laughs> now they paint once again, but in a way very different. It was a time that um, mostly more the main artists uh, worked very large scale of uh, canvases. Now we can ask, what's going on with these uh, canvases? You know, so um, at the time I started to think about uh, not only about the doing, but what's happening after that? In case nobody won't buy, or you know, so what happens? And also using the acrylic paint, and acrylic paint is kind of kind of poison. So in this um, consciousness, I started, you know, I studied in Spain, and um, very fortunate on my um, process of the, just learning process of the old technique. It's extempora, and the extempora is really highly uh, natural, so egg and oil. And the uh, materiality of this fusion uh, uh, of oil-based and um, water-based, so they're coming together. The pose was for me kind of a one practice, not only about, uh, um, of course, this consciousness about ecology, but also about this uh, witness of them, for me, kind of like Eastern way of thinking, and also this solid of oil color. I, myself, I had this idea to mix these both ways approach to the material, because this is a base. And, and the other things is uh, um, the narratives. The stories is not only um, spoken or uh, represented. So at the beginning, I was starting maybe um, to tell in the painting, in the images of the narratives. So you could see the figures and the trees of, like you said, forest of the sea. But um, and so during my development, I also started to uh, concentrate all the stories in one image. So the narrative is, is in one. So this is but the different time. 
<laughs> this was a quite recent work, uh, work that I have done as a huge sculpture. So in my case, it's also a painter, but also work with sculpture, and also drawing, and I make you feel um, I'm very curious about. I never stop to be very curious, and I do try. So this was a, one of my first largest sculpture. <clears throat> it's more than four, four and a half meter. And in one sculpture, I wanted to condense all the meanings and all the possible meanings, all the significance in one. The stories in one. You can make stories with the sculpture. So this was uh, um, Valencia in front of the Calatrava's huge monumental uh, architecture, which was also kind of gender fight because I thought, oh my God. <coughs> but it was so, I thought I focused on the, not about the site. It's about uh, this um, idea and also not idea, but uh, images. Hi, Nico. Um, maybe this gender uh, issue uh, could be explored a little more because also it concerns Martin's work quite a lot because there are so many things to say from this point of view about the sculpture, if you don't mind. Yes, um, I was always uh, very critical about gender since I'm, I'm born. I was not a um, nice girl at all, like uh, my parents wished. So I was not this kawaii girl. You know the kawaii? <laughs> I was not a girl. I never wanted to get married as a child. So I was already kind of emancipated to a um, girl. But on the other side, I never tell me and call me myself as a feminist because I don't like any ideology. So, but I live like a feminist, of course. And my consciousness is that I think we have to give the chance also to men. So we need uh, this kind of um, juxtaposition of different <laughs> sexes. The, the gender uh, issue is uh, now it's a question, but for me it was not. Always accompanied me. So in this sculpture, for example, there's, you can see the masculine part of, you know, Farnish, um, how do you say that? And, uh, Part, and but also this opening, this is like womb. It's architecture, in the, but also opening the body. So you can see the both ways, and this is a connection to the universe and my cosmology. Um, would you like to continue? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to continue with the presentation, yeah. or shall yeah. we go more into it? If you like, please, I do not want to take all the time. So this was also a uh, line figures. I thought, you know, I'm uh, reflecting sometimes also the history of art, but the history of art was very Western and very male fixed. So how is the represent representation of women? So just uh, women's representation idealized by men's just. So what is that if I feel even I'm not so not sure my, about my gender's uh, condition, you know, because I have this feeling that we change, you know. So, um, you know, it's a question of a hormone, and uh, sometimes it's less and more, and so I am more freedom, kind of freedom. So in this case, but if I were a woman, what is the feeling in your body? So I did the sculptures, and my paintings are always from inside. And I don't use any photograph, any interest, um, you know, social media, but uh, my uh, media is me, myself. I'm media, so what is that when I feel this kind of woman's condition? But even before, it is a um, transition, as you said, I'm interested in transition. How it is uh, from the child to the adult. And I noticed it's most interesting time for me is the adolescence. It's between the children and to, the, to be a woman or whatever. So, so-called a girl. We call it just transition time girls. And, but this is a very special time 
but which I really would like to keep it. Even, it doesn't matter how old I am. It doesn't matter how old you are, or child, or man, or whatever. We have this, this sensibility. And this is the most sensitive time. It's the most, it's a lot of chance in ourselves. Because we are in this transition, accepting this, this transition, we are open-minded. And so, it's, for example, we never talk about the vulnerability, but we are, you know, the most sensitive persons, every one of us. But we don't, we, um, our education is not to show it. And I would say, show it. This is my, my dream also, to be more honest. So this is, for example, this line figures. It shows the, you know, the weakest part and those unsure, unsureness. And this is for me, also. But you can't say what exactly. So my narrative is not um, to explain, it's just a feeling. Well, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, shall we perhaps um, continue with your work? Yes. Um, your work Maita, also fuses, um, let's say, Eastern and non-Eastern and extra-Occidental and some Occidental references, because I'm trying to be as careful as possible with all these notions. Uh, they are so generic. Um, uh, for example, you mentioned Paula Rebov, one of your inspirations, uh, an amazing painter and also her uh, magical realist paintings, but also the narratives from your paintings, or the characters you use, they come from this folklore of Khalij yes. culture, which is the <laughs> Arab Gulf region. And I would like maybe to start with um, something I consider important and would uh, be important also for the audiences to understand, um, could you speak about the source? Could you speak about the source? Is there a written corpus of these mythologies, or how did you find them? Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, because this was a person to say. Okay. Um, I this with you, Mike. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, um, when I started with um, my work, um, I, especially like part of mythology, wasn't always intentional. The the um, the ideas and the the, the, um, the mythology that I the, the stories that I uh, that I came up with part of it comes from stories that I heard uh, as a as a child. Um, I, I grew up with uh, five other sisters, and uh, my parents were always traveling and working, and uh, living with my grandmother at the time, with my sisters, and she was much of a storyteller. And uh, living with her in, in, in an old house with uh, a lot of uh, animals, um, she always used to tell stories. Uh, and one of them is about the rooster being the only creature that could see angels. Um, she would always used to say, if you hear a rooster, ask God for forgiveness because there are angels around. And uh, I grew up with stories like that. Um, and I was very curious to kind of like document them as a kid, but in a very kind of like... Uh, storytelling, uh, just trying to write a novel at some point, and uh, using these characters that, uh, and from the stories that my grandmother used to say, and the, uh, those, are, those, those stories come from certain beliefs in the region, about the rooster, about the pig, about the donkey, which I introduced this year to my work. Uh, but then as I grew up and um, uh, had to work on my graduation project. Only then I decided to merge both the stories and the written to to uh, to the visuals that I create, to the paintings, to the sculptures, to the performative work. 
um, and and those those stories, those characters that were, um, you know, just stories and characters from beliefs and mythology, turned into my own, representing myself, and um, there I decided to take them from just that to something more personal, um, but also theatrical and done in a storytelling way. Um, I was very curious, as I said, like I grew up with five other sisters and I was, as you said, like very unpleasant growing up, wanting to be independent, wanting to have like my own voice, felt that like I'm um, with, um, uh, you know, um, when you have like only sisters, you just wanted to, you know, to, to kind of just create a character that is unique. And um, I was stubborn. I wanted to gain independence. As soon as I turned 18, it was everything that I could think of. Um, and and uh, I mean, this is also a good moment to kind of um, uh, tell us more about how you address gender in your work. Yes. So so um, yeah. So I did I did I did an exhibition like my first exhibition with the gallery was. Uh, a solo exhibition I did two at that time in 2020. It was in London and uh, and Dubai. Um, and the, the, the idea, the concept of the exhibition was that thin line between um, a child and adulthood. And I chose that concept because that is when I decided to, or I, I had acknowledged some kind of like gender, um, the notion of gender. Um, I grew up, as I said, wanting to kind of like become strong. I was like, um, you know, thought to become like a tomboy, uh, climbing trees, uh, running around, playing football with the boys. And as soon as I hit, you know, that age where I'm now an adult, I was expected to um, I was expected to behave differently and I was expected to become a woman uh, wear differently uh, talk differently and that's where I was questioning a lot the idea of how how do I keep myself but then also uh, gain independence and become this character that I always wanted to become. Um, and that's when I turned 18, I decided to travel solo. And there came like the idea of what I'm working in right now, which is the notions of sin and forgiveness, right and wrong, which uh, is he very heavy in my work. Um, and there the mythology also like came along with these two notions. The idea of the rooster that I, <coughs> Uh, that uh, I explained, explained earlier, the rooster is um, uh, a character that is heavily in my work, um, and it is a metaphor to forgiveness and right, uh, coming from the story and mythology of the rooster being the only creature that could see angels. And then on the other hand, you uh, uh, might see in my work a lot of ref references to, to the pig, the pig is a simple animal in the region. You can't use the, you can't eat uh, the pig. Use the skin, use the oil. Um, so in my work, it is represented to that sin and wrong and dark. And then recently, I introduced the um, the donkey in my work um, in a sculpture in Switzerland, uh, part of uh, uh, an exhibition at KBHG. Um, and the donkey is is in mythology um, is the, the animal that could see the devil, unlike the rooster, it is an animal that could see the devil, so if you hear, if you hear a donkey, then devils are around. And just like to answer your question before, like the, the stories are pretty much uh, oral. They have, uh, they have a side of uh, religious beliefs, but then like became into this kind of like more of uh, mythology, uh, 
um, that uh, uh, grandmas would tell their grandchildren. Um, so I think, yeah. No, and d these characters just like grew with me as a kid, becoming from like just like these uh, innocent kind of like mythology that haunted me as a kid. Something very personal and uh, exploring this idea and identity of like two extreme notions of sin and forgiveness and how do you navigate that. Um, yeah. I think we're in uh, the very interesting intersection here between uh, gender, transformation, transmutation, so there was kind of like a transitional state and also uh, it is interesting the way so you integrate, so you quote, you integrate, you also change the meaning in a way, you use it in a specific way uh, and it is part of the sub let's say pictorial tradition, which is partly Western, but uh, there's cultural work as well. And I wanted to um, remind, I, um, during uh, my um, introduction, I mentioned Marina Warner, who um, wrote this uh, after the Venetian text, the Catalog of the Venice Biennial, who was so crucial for the concept of metamorphosis and mutation. And the text is about witches' jewels, which is also called shape-shifting jewels or it is also called transformation change. We all know what it is, so that this moment in, in mythological tales, in fairy tales, uh, where the, the tale with four princes or the main character start shifting, it's start transforming itself into animals, then into objects, and into many things, uh, into mountains, into some kind of uh, uh, trees, and all that is part of a fight. So you fight each other uh, through transformation, through this uh, vertiginous ability to transform itself. Uh, and of course, from today's point of view, so she was writing about it during the COVID, so meaning the mutation was so important back then. But also from the point of view of uh, mythologists, uh, she noticed that this ability was fascinating uh, in absolutely all cultures. So she quotes mythologies from India, from the Arab world, uh, of course, so from the West world. So this ability fascinated people, but also from our point of view, what, it, what does it say about ecology? What does it say about us belonging? And what I also liked uh, about it um, is the notion, um, and I quote, that the slippery definitions of humanity. So this is what was interesting uh, in this particular project, but also for many other projects, how, and this is what Nicola partly was uh, talking about, how indeed, like, in reality, we can step behind the human-centric work, exhibitions, worldviews, because we're so used to it, you know, and it has been so present, it was shaping our minds, also our work. So how can it happen, but also in a sensible way, sensitive and, and, and intelligent? Uh, and um, uh, and I think your work uh, is in, in, in this realm, operates in this realm and has its interest and tries to, to precisely capture uh, these moments, you know, will get, bring us closer you know, uh, to the slippery definitions of humanity, if I may to quote it again. I don't know, Lipo, what can you answer? <laughs> about humanity, for example? Or uh, uh, about, we, we still we can, we continue sort of like this yeah. transition, yes. And then how yeah, how do we go beyond human centric like human-centric views? Oh, okay, this is a very important thing. So, would you maybe show a couple of those girls in here, maybe not? I wanted to. Uh, I would like to show you, which is quite recent work, where you can you could see kind of a um, female figure. It's like this, but you could maybe enlarge it. Is that the first one? And maybe the right one. And this is also the left one. Is also this about this forest idea, and but in my case, it's all the humans and nature symbol. They come together, and uh, they was quite. Um, recent works where I can't say, uh, <laughs> if you could enlarge it, yeah. Um, I was thinking about uh, this, uh, the moment of concentration, as uh, the, you can't say if it's a gender, it's a man or a woman, but it's a 
um, in embarrassing something, birds or animals or child. So in my case, it's also this the concept of human is, I would like to extend also a human idea, humanity idea, with animals, with trees, and with all the living things. This is a, a kind of a, yeah, since I'm a, a child, I think about that. So it's a, animals, if I observe animals, they are more human than we do. They don't fight for Nothing like money. So, you know, they fight maybe for the food or something very clearly. They would like to be caressed or, you know, this longing for love, longing for food. It's all just um, erotic things. But um, so I think our emotional base is also the base for um, the nowadays crisis because I think. Uh, so this crisis came maybe because we kept the humans and animals down low, you know, and all the animals and other livings are not. So this is, a, for me, the Western idea of humanity. And I would like to extend this humanity idea for all. Well, thank you. And then also the all this nature culture division, uh, a lot of recent research uh, shows uh, about how, um, well, how art-specific and precise it is and uh, how it has never been the case. For example, I read an absolutely beautiful story about how birds learn to sing. So it's not that they are born, you know, with this ability to sing many birds. They have to learn it. And they have to learn it from, the, from their parents. They have to acquire it. That means it is culture. <laughs> it is no longer nature. There's an acquisition process. That's, um, and my um, next question is to Maita um, about the work, this particular work, who has also this uh, kind of like morphing figures. You presented the Sharja Biennial, and it was a very important biennial um, conceived by Ogwe and Vazer. Yeah. Um, so, maybe that would be yeah, nice to say. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have images of the Sharja Biennial work, but. Um, I did work so that the idea for me um, um, uh, with like the mutation of the body. So I, I I like to use my own body. Let's say like when I paint, I like to think of myself as a performer, whether I would be painting or uh, creating the sculpture or performing. Like it, it all starts with performance for me, and the work starts um, um, the work starts in the studio and. For me, the work is while I perform, and then the outcome of that is what you see in the gallery. Um, to me, when I started, when I started um, um, with this concept of sin and forgiveness, um, I decided to to uh, work on the body in different in a different way, where it is muted and deformed because of Sin. So uh, a lot of the, the the bodies that you see in my work, whether it is in the sculpture or uh, or the paintings, they have uh, this kind of um, like like in this photograph here or in this painting, they kind of like bodies, human bodies that have deformed. Um, this these are bronze sculptures that I did recently for uh, in Switzerland, half human body and half animal body, uh, deformed and mutated. Um, so, um, so yeah, th this is, um, this is how I took, uh, the body, the, how I took mythology, um, from the Gulf. If, if we talked about mythology in the Gulf, a lot of the characters that, um, uh, come from there, like, I'll just say one of them is, is, uh, uh, Umid Duwais. It's a character that is, um, 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 that is a female, but muted where it has uh, donkey feet. And this character comes at night to seduce men and then eat them. Um, and similar to other mythologies and stories, it all has like these human-like features, but then deformed into different animals. 
And in my work, this is what I did, but in the mutation, the, the actual bodies have mutated because of their doing, because, because of their sin, because of their agony, because of their um, uh, fight um, in, inside them. So you see a lot of these works uh, and a lot of these characters are either fighting or intimate or in conversation um, um, in my work. And it's, it's representing oneself and one body that is like uh, multiplied into different creatures and different characters that are um, uh, that have came together to to uh, to create one uh, one body of work. Thank you. Uh, I would like already to start opening uh, the floor to questions uh, from the audience, uh, and you can start thinking about it. Uh, I just want. <coughs> to address maybe a last one, since we have not really spoken about, uh, let's say, technicality of your work, uh, because <coughs> you produce sculptures and painting, different techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe this is something to address uh, before we open uh, the vote of the audiences. Uh, about technical aspects? Uh, about how, uh, in a sense, um, so the two medium, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, let's say, from my point of view, and I'm a curator, so I have no technical knowledge mm -hmm. of, 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 you know, neither painting or sculpture. And of course, you could imagine that painting is um, something more fluid, something easier to handle, because a sculpture, and especially it's when we spoke, when we speak about like transformation, you know, mutation, transition, but maybe I'm completely wrong. No, um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, in a way, I have uh, chosen very different material, and so, uh, for example, uh, I would like to talk about ceramics also, because ceramics is uh, from the earth, Maybe you can find one ceramic sculpture. Uh, I started to work on ceramics when Navani worked with it. And uh, you know, the art and craft was uh, completely divided. And uh, I had the feeling that quite recently they we start to rethink, start to rethink about this uh, division. And so that, uh, um, you know, things with uh, hand, with with hand, uh, I value a lot, but many of them is not conceptual right now. So it was uh, in that time in the 80s, uh, mid 80s, people said, well, oh, you are doing ashtrays, you know, it's kind of a, a <laughs> in a despective way. But for me, it was very important to use and work with the material, because and the technique is, in a way, for my feeling, uh, not easy, but very natural. Because, uh, as might also say, in my case also, it's very similar in a way, my work is also performative. When I paint, it's a kind of body performance. It's for me like dance. And when I do a drawing, also similar. It's a, everything is about, you know, the fusion of uh, spirit, ideas, and body, and sensuality. So all come together, and this is a feeling with clay, the most um, yeah, natural way to feel it. And uh, this maybe they are also first done with clay, and even three meters uh, high, I did with clay in Japan, and then transformed it with a 3D technique. Maybe you can show also a couple of glass objects. No further? Further. Yeah, like this. I would like to show also one of um, <coughs> about technique. It's uh, maybe your material. It's a glass. It's also quite newly developed and discovered um, materiality and also technique. Because also I for that I need help, and I use very very. Uh, Nobody completely by my own, and uh, it's important to do everything with me. But the glass object, I needed help, and this was also important cognition that uh, uh, you do things, you create things with somebody together. 
And this community feeling was also very beautiful. And also the transparency, even the same form I developed in ceramic, but also in glass object. So quite recent ex experience. Uh, um, can we speak here about Brancusi reference? Or is it completely misplaced? Absolutely, absolutely right. I adore Brancusi, and also because of his transcultural aspect. He was, you know, from the East, I mean, Romanian, basically, kind of East at the time, so he came to Paris. And I um, felt kind of a consentment, or how to say that, kind of a feeling together with him. And uh, his uh, study of the, from the very concrete things to the abstraction. And this idea, and especially I was very impressed by the face, and then, as I told you, I like this uh, kind of uh, um, telling story in a non-vulgar way. And uh, I felt this face I would like to recreate in you know, my personal way. And this was, uh, for example, inspired by Barbusi, but it's mine, I would say. And uh, also, this is a you know, massive, you, uh, it's very heavy, this object, it's like that. This, where you can, I can't carry it. And uh, this um, uh, idea came also during the corona, because you talked about uh, also corona things. So maybe show, uh, mention it very briefly. Um, about this time was very condensed and of course difficult time for everybody, but also for me, very rich experience, because being home, being at my studio, traveling is also my, um, you know, everyday life. But it was uh, interesting traveling in a way in your studio. It was a very intensive time. My second, uh, what about you? So, do you also dance with the sculptures? I love dancing. <laughs> I'm not good at it, but I love But, I, uh, no, but I really connect to what you said. For me, performance, performance is what starts everything. I think more um, uh, before I produce. Producing comes natural after a long time of thinking and, and, and visualizing and writing. And then the, the way I work is extremely performative where I would set the stage. I always like to say that it's the stage before I paint, because I put the, the, the canvas on the floor, this is how I start. Um, I'm, I know what kind of music that is, you know, that will set me to go. I know what scent I'm going to be uh, using before I uh, start producing. And, and it is more like a performance or a dance. Um, um, and, and once you start, you cannot stop. I cannot stop once I start because, and I cannot change the song as well because it, it, it di dictates the rhythm that I'm working on. I had a funny story, I was working one time and it was like, it was a huge piece, uh, and it was a painting. Um, and I was working on one part and I was listening to this song and I had it on repeat because I don't want to change the rhythm um, that I'm working at. And I have my neighbor knock on my door, it's like, what's going like, I, you know, like it's the same song going on, and it's like I have to finish this fight. So it's it's kind of like very performative in in that sense because um, um, I I cannot think while I work. I'm a very fast kind of like uh, speed working, and I work a lot with my body and my uh, my fingers. That I use oil, very toxic, but I I use it. You know, I barely use a, a brush. I always like to use my hands, whether it was a painting, and then with a sculpture as well, it's very kind of like formative, where I like to use my fingers. If you can just show the sculpture work. Uh, well, no, this one here, if, if you can see, like this is bronze, but it was done in clay at first, and using my hands, and it clearly shows. Um, I think we're running out of time. Yeah, but. As we said, it's, it starts with a performance and then the outcome comes uh, in, uh, in the final work. Thank you. Uh, questions? Um, yes. 
Now is the moment. We still have five minutes for questions, no? Oh, we have three minutes for questions. Well, please, anytime. Uh, but um, I, I'm kind of like remembering something we wanted to address, and uh, three minutes, I think, uh, it's uh, short, but uh, still possible. Um, coming back to, to, to mythology, you know, uh, so mythologies are collective, like the really per definition collective bodies of, uh, let's say, imagination, collective imagination. Uh, but then at some point, uh, you know, there was a sort of like a, a well, let's say, trend or fashion or intellectual. Um, uh, like intellectual fashion uh, started by Harald Digman about personal mythologies, like individual mythologies. There were a huge projects about it. Uh, what the individual mythologies mean, of course, it means that artist is building uh, her own world. So, and then Elio uh, reacted <laughs> to it at some point. I think maybe it would be a good uh, finishing point uh, to speak about it. So how can we think about it today? Can we speak? Because I think that saying that mythology is individual is kind of modernizing it. And going back to it as a kind of collective body of knowledge uh, brings us to the source somehow. What do you think? No, it's a very um, interesting point. And of uh, course, I remember in um, my youth, I was completely against what the Harald Seven said. He said, individual mythology. I said, oh, this is not true. It's a collective. Mythology is always collective somehow. But I, of course, understood later on because we are, since I'm um, working so more than 40 years, it's, I'm creating my own mythology, but connected to this collective mythology. So uh, I would say it's a, beautiful um, words, beautiful um, slogans that we maybe might need, maybe mythology of our time, I would say, that we create together. <laughs> um, I think this is a perfect ending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question. I'd like to know how you combine the phenomenon with the future mythology and to the collective mythology. <laughs> Moment that you think is my aspect, and then you can share. I think this is, for example, about unconsciousness. Because I lived as a CEO, so uh, different cultures, so on. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because I left my country to forget everything, you know. <laughs> then in Europe, I was, you know, all the time kind of recalls I like. How to say reconciling, and uh, but also discovering once again my origin mm -hmm. in a way, but always you know the questioning, watching, what am I? Why am I here? Uh, but it's uh, also very important that we get together. That's from my belief, because you know I I come from the country like Japan. There was a lot of uh, um, the country was hurt, and also there had a lot of problem. On the other side, they re rejected their own culture. It was very difficult for me after the war, born and to find cultural root, because it was, it was broken, it was destroyed. And they were all for America and very much westernized. But in a way, it's not true. It's uh, a bit of fake, you know. It's not plastic, it's just plastic. There's a different way of beauty. But they just uh, took over. So I wanted to see the real balances, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, if I see the Western culture, I really wanted to see the real one. But then I found, you know, wow, but Hoxha is also good, huh? <laughs> like that. <laughs> and this is a kind of, a, and the older stories, the mythologies of, you know, collective stories, I think. And it's as conditioned by cultural situations. But if I live, in those um, unconditioned, in a very foreign countries without any protection, fighting every day. And uh, I created, of course, I had created my own world. 
but uh, to communicate to you, you know, this is the sense of art for me. And this is how I would say communicating. And always, um, you know, underneath is our, our longing and our dreams. It's very similar, all the cultures, isn't it? And this is so beautiful to get knowing each other. And this is my experience in Europe. And also, we like to continue. Thank you.